Okay. So um, I want to welcome everyone to this very, very special event and, and our, you know, Grand Rounds, the first commemorative Grand Rounds for our, our dear, our beloved Zena Stain. Um, we're here to pay tribute to, celebrate uh, our beloved incomparable Zena Stain. I am personally honored to chair this session as the current director of the HIV Center for Clinical Behavioral Studies, which I think, as you all know, was founded back in 1987 by Anka Earhart and Zena Stain. It's fair to say that I was raised into this role where I sit by both Zena and Anka and mentored by them. Zena was a very important and central mentor to me. As we know, she's a giant in the field of HIV prevention and care and human rights. She was smartly and bluntly critical of, of <laughs> all of us, especially some of us when we wrote our very first papers in the center. <laughs> but we, we thought we appreciated her, her bluntness and her, her insights. And most of all, to me, she was a cherished friend. Um, while Zena is no longer physically with us in this world, she is very much alive in all of us. And that's why we're all here today. What I believe will live on in all of us, definitely within me, is her intellect, her warmth, her wit, her charm, her dedication to addressing inequities across the globe, and her love of family, <laughs> family, friends, and colleagues. And thus we are gathered here today to express our admiration and love for Zena and to honor her. And, you know, things that are most important in this world are not physical, but more importantly, it's about keeping our memories of, and love and respect alive for Zena and all those who have departed. With that said, there is one physical object that I am proud to be the proud inheritor of and will cherish always, and that's Zena's gavel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, she would always use this when we were gathered in the multi-purpose room to, when she was chairing our grand rounds like I'm doing today. She would use this gavel to quiet the room because everyone was chatting, like we said a moment ago, and having coffee and visiting with each other. But she would use this to bring the meeting to order. So in the spirit of Zena, I hereby call this meeting to order for all of you. Um, for you, Zena, and um, Zena, who is our person to always call us to action, I now call us to action. Um, we have a panel of speakers today representing Zena's family and dear colleagues and friends, each to speak a bit about Zena. I will introduce them one, one, one by one before they speak. Um, and very briefly, um, because he has lost his voice, but he's here with us is Ezra Susser. Um, Zena's son and professor in epidemiology and psychiatry here at Columbia. Um, and he will start, and then let me he, right away turn it over to, to Ida, um, who of course is Zena's daughter, a distinguished professor of anthropology at the Graduate Center at CUNY. Um, Ida worked in collaboration with the HIV Center for many years, as did Ezra, and, and um, she developed anthropological research around questions of women's power and access to treatment and prevention, analyzing engagement with social movements with respect to HIV AIDS in the US, Puerto Rico and Southern Africa. Um, so I turn it over to, um, to briefly to Ezra and then to Ida. Thanks, Bob. Um, I have strep throat, but I do want to say just two things. One, one is that um, I feel so lucky to have had like such an extraordinary mother. Um, it's really, in looking back, it was a blessing. And the other thing I wanted to say is that the um, HIV center was really special to her. It was like, I, I think she got so much from the love and the warmth of the HIV center. And I guess gave it back to. So this is like a very special, um, special event, you know. Um, and I, Ida is going to talk for me and has some slides I did. Um, and she has a French haircut. So I think she <laughs> she'll be great. So thanks. <laughs> thanks, Ezra. Well, um, this is a very much a family effort, as I was telling people. Ezra gave me the slides, Philip helped me put them together, Sally gave, helped Ezra, so, and Ruthie is there all the time. So, and I think that my mother really 
loved the HIV center, but you gave her the strength and the vibrancy to keep going to 99. I mean, seriously, with her children, her grandchildren, her great grandchildren and the HIV center, she would have gone on forever. So the intellectual and the caring. I'm very happy to be speaking here. And um, I'm going to share, uh -huh, I'm going to share screen. Okay. So um, as everybody else here, our wonderful, um, uh, you know, intellectual, huge, uh, important things to say about the things that my mom did in the HIV center. And although I work with her and, and everybody welcomed me and from with Anka and my mother on the stuff and the working on the women's issues and HIV, it certainly was really uh, liberating and inspiring for me. But I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to try to give you a sense of her as a person and as an intellectual, because she died before she actually uh, came to HIV center. That's just when HIV came in. And the point I want to make here is that the co there was a coherence and a wholeness to her life. And journalists have asked me uh, about her disparate work. You know, they, they, but, but she, um, she did so many things over so many 70 years, whatever. How can you, but how can you understand them? And to me, they all make complete sense, flying right through them and through her life in general. I'm really happy to be presenting these in her early life. So what and what she gave to uh, all of our family was an incredible sense of excitement, curiosity, commitment to social justice, and that you can enjoy life, so you can't have it all. You can do the things you want to do. Like she never had it all, so many backwards and children and so many challenges, but she kept going and she kept a kind of amazing vitality and excitement through her whole life. And you can see it in her smiles. Here she is when she's a teenager and she was always active, you know, mountain climbing, swimming, everything. And you can see it like she's wearing her school uniform there, but it's always very alive. And then she was raised in a family which was, you know, uh, my, my grandmother had tried to work, well, not tried to work, she was trained as a secretary, which was very unusual, and went to seminars when she was 19, 20 years old. She married late, and she married a, a man who was quite uh, an amazing math professor because he studied at Cambridge with little wooden hardy, very interesting. Anyway, but they, during the 30s, my grandmother was super active, and she brought in Jewish refugees from Germany over and over in South Africa. Many of them knew all our lives. So my mom soaked in a sense of social justice and of the troubles of the world, I guess, let's do something, from her very young age. And um, of course, she was living in South Africa and the, the what you might call the colonial color bar was in in place horrendously, not as bad as it became in 1948 with the fascist nationalist government, but even when she was growing up in the 30s and 40s, there was an, you know, the oppressions of colonialism. So she was very aware of that. And by the time she got to college, she went to college when she was 16, um, she already started taking courses with a guy called Jack Simons, who was a very well-known Marxist historian of Southern Africa. And that's, I think, what brought her straight into real historical analysis. She always talked about Jack Simons. He's famous beyond my mother. I read something on Wikipedia uh, about 
you know, the number of people in Angola who trained among the, the, uh, the people who were fighting underground for South African independence and liberation. But anyway, Jack Simons was the person from the University of Cape Town. And although, and the other thing that, so she did from having this sense of social justice and having um, a sense of you have to really act and you have to really change the world and help people. She also uh, was a feminist from like, it was in her bones. And like my grandfather, you know, it was those olden days you might say. So when she was about 12, she wanted to go to medical school, but you had to go and study Latin. You couldn't get into medical school and didn't study Latin. And my grandfather said, go to medical school anyway, forget about the Latin. So instead she went to history, but she was a feminist and she, and my grandmother too. So this, she didn't forget. And um, she did uh, her, her uh, one thesis for her BA on indentured laborers and how they came to South Africa. And the, then she went on and did a master's, uh, which was on the French Revolution. <laughs> which got her into Cambridge with a, with a scholarship, a very fancy scholarship. I think it's called the Victoria Scholarship. Anyway, but she couldn't go or she didn't go because it was World War II. And instead she joined the army. But what I wanted to say here before I go on, that was very important that she joined the army because that's where she saw my dad, they got together. But let me just say that I believe when I'm trying to say about her thinking, I believe that her whole view of the world was informed by her historical understandings, by her perspective on context, contingency, human agency, and she brought that to public health. And in my way of seeing things, I know it was her idea of the Dutch famine. She, they all, she and my dad lived through the war, they knew about the Dutch famine. They knew about the resistance of the Dutch people and how they destroyed the railroads so that the Germans couldn't bring their troops in. And they thought, and their spies, they thought that that was the end of the war. And the war went on a year and Holland wasn't liberated. So the famine was much longer than people expected. My mom knew all about that, but she was also at the time studying um, children and spontaneous abortion. And I believe that it was a combination of a history background and her openness to really a lot of intellectual ideas, including anthropology, but her history background combined with her focus on feminism and children and babies and fetuses and her understanding of public health that led the two of them, my mom and dad, to, to develop the Dutch famine study, which I think is like a keystone study in epidemiology. I'm not an epidemiologist, but it's a keystone study to me. I, I think it's like, and when we asked her when she was dying in the last year, more or less, well, we didn't know she was dying, but she was 99. Um, we asked her, you know, what do you think was your most important? Book? And she said the Dutch famine study. So I, that's a a recognition and a con con of her powerful intellect and her commitment to ideas of public health and, and feminism and children and all those kinds of things. So um, the momentous thing was that when she uh, went to the army, she met my dad again. He was the best friend of her, her brother, so she knew him. But she went in the army as an exam tester to see if people could become, um, air, I suppose, navigators and things like that. And my dad, who'd been in the artillery and the infantry and all over the Western Desert and then to Brook and LMA, they met at this testing place. And that was, that was kind of when they got together. So then after that, I have a picture here of my mom and dad, and that's me as I was child but I wanted to show you they were together from then on until you know until the 2000s so all the work they did was to get all nearly all their work was 
co susser and stain or stain and susser, susser and stain. And it began early. And I want that kind of, that's why I wanted this picture of them together from, from the beginning. So they went together from the army. They did study at night and took uh, courses in science so they could get into medical school. And by then, of course, there were no rules about Latin because these were GIs with the GI Bill and they got into medical school. So they went in together. And uh, I also want to point out to some, I guess, people who think about children and work and how hard it is and everything like that. My mom and dad were in South Africa where they had, you know, people helping them. It was a, a, it was a racist society and there were ideas babysitters and uh, African help. However, she was in residency when, oh, she was an intern when she was pregnant and she told me she fainted when she was pregnant uh, and they had to get a, a replacement and look at the blood or whatever it was. And then she also that when I was a little baby this age, she was in the room and she was in shock and trauma because coming in with knives and things like that. But my grandmother came to help her. So I feel that all of these things show the ways also family and support uh, are important in, in the making of anybody, especially in women's lives and families. And she didn't do it alone either. My dad was super, super, super supportive. Uh, they worked together and in every job that they got. Well, he got. And so the first job that they got together was at Alexandra Township. And you can see they were, they worked at the clinic. You can see that clinic on the side. And they set up some interesting things in the clinic. For example, there was no addresses. And so in order to, this, I don't know if it was exactly my mother, but my mom and dad, in order to keep track of women after they went home with their babies, they would arrange for the ambulance or some kind of uh, transportation to take the mother back to where she was living, which was like a, an informal settlement with no addresses and you know houses built of tin and corrugated iron. And because of that, they could then follow up with um, uh, nurses in, uh, coming to help the baby, uh, food and all. So they began to think about public health right from that moment. And they were learning very much Park, who um, was very, very important to them and was already at Corella. So this all went very well and they shared the job with two other people. It was all very collaborative, and communal and every other way. And Huma Zakela was delivered in that clinic and all kinds of things like that. But then uh, my dad was supposed to speak at an ANC uh, in Dallas because they were very, all this time, political actors against uh, the fascist, racist, anti uh, regime. And when my dad was uh, supposed to be on this platform, the, the clinic told him they couldn't stay on the job. So both of them had to leave and they had no job. And that's after that, they thought they would join uh, Sydney Park at Palella, but in the end that didn't work out and they came to England. And so I had the next slide, which is, why isn't it going? They, they told me I'd have trouble. Uh, let's see what I can do. Oh, and this is Manchester. So there you have Ruthie in the middle and Ezra and me with some children. I think it's Patsy. Not, oh, now we are. Okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry, Bob. I got it. I did it. <laughs> and on the right is my mom and her older brother, Wolf, a younger brother, Wilfred. You can see he's like 60. And... Um, they lived with us when we went to London because nobody had any money and they were kind of, it was romantic, I think, for South Africans. They were actually having to cook and shop. No heat and they froze to death. We all, me and my brother and sister froze to death because my parents didn't understand about heat and we saw snow for the first time. Anyway, uh, Wolfred, who's in the picture there, he was, they, him and his family shared a house with us and then later on, they came to live opposite us in Manchester. So we were all very close. And in Manchester, uh, my mom, my dad had the job in social medicine, but my mom always had uh, research grants. And she always had a position at the University of Manchester. She used the 
you know, Turin invented the computer at Manchester. She used the computer all night long. She went and put her on children and, and problems and mental health and mental, cha mental challenges. All the surveys that they did uh, that she got funded through the government went through this computer, which was like two rooms large and you could only use it in the middle of the night. So she was gone every night. And she had been in London working in a, a mental institution at night. She always managed somehow to do these things. And um, so then, we, uh, we spent quite a while in Manchester. That's kind of where I feel like I grew up. But then we came to New York. That's us all at the top of the, the Empire State Building when we came to New York yeah. the first year. And um, so we all came to New York. And my mom, uh, after the first year studying um, on research on children, then came to um, the Psychiatric Institute and she did a lot of research on different things, but what she, I just want to point out like the social justice and the feminist issues, because even in that time, she was looking at spontaneous abortion. And the reason she had begun to think about that, that she used to talk to me about, was the data from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and ways in which radiation had affected the fetus. That's what she was teaching me about. And I think that's where her ideas came from. And later, Agent Orange, she also worked with GIs and many researchers at Columbia on those kind of issues. And so that's how her spontaneous abortion studies began. Like at what moment would changes take place in the fetus first come through nine months? And when was, you know, when were, were these different infections going or radiation health of the babe and the fetus? And she wrote on the life cycle. So she was doing all those kind of things. And while very much working internationally, oh, very much having parties with the uh, HIV Center, the Department of Epidemiology and everything else always in our garden. Some of you probably remember. My dad's sitting on a rocking chair and my mom's on the side. But to tell you the truth, this is a coming of age ceremony for the grandchildren. My mom invented, she invented it because she had not allowed us to have bar mitzvahs because my dad only wanted boys to have them, something like that. We never had anything like that. So she invented a coming of age ceremony for all the different cousins. And that's actually what this picture is. She was very creative and very social justice oriented. Anyway, she didn't want it to be religious. She didn't want it to be for men only, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so then also though, so they always were people staying with us, Elias there from Chile who had escaped from prison. And before that, all the time we were growing up, we had people in exile from South Africa staying with us, their children staying with us. My parents had an incredibly open house of people coming to live with us all the time and many times. But anyway, so that's how they were. And they had really, really, really a wonderful friends. I know you. Croatia and Slim, and that's Mary on the other side. International friends, and that's Naneba, and that's my dad and mom, and that's Violet Cherry. Now, Violet Pariacci Cherry, she's not alive anymore. She had been trained by Sydney Cart at Palela, and she was my mom and dad's friend forever. We were there when, you know, we went to see her in hospital before she died. We knew her family, but the thing is, they met because they were all so committed to the community health that Sydney Park had invented. And they worked together on uh, Chisa, which was to help Southern Africa. And then down below, that's Roberta Belmar, who was a Chilean doctor who escaped as an exile from Chile in the 1970s. And they worked with for 20 years till he went back to Chile as the Minister of Health again. So they always had an incredible international set of friends and, and not only research. And this is the, she said that she wanted to live until her next great grandchild was born. And this is my, uh, my grandson, Rafi, who is now a year old. And he was only, what was it, like two years old at the time that she was having her 99th birthday. And he wasn't sure until the very, very day 
if uh, Jonah and Virginia were up with the baby to driving to my mother's birthday. And they finally, uh, and the very morning, they thought, well, maybe they'd have the energy. Virginia thought, oops, I've lost the picture. I hope you could. But Virginia thought that, yes, she could do it. And we drove four hours to the birthday party. And there's my mom. And then she said, now I, I've done, this is it. I really don't need this anymore. <laughs> and she loved the intellectual and she loved the family and she loved the visits from Slim and Croatia and Vistianka and everybody else. But I think at 99, she felt really fine right. with that being her life. And, and, loved, and I just want to say that to everybody here, how much she really loved you. Okay, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Ida, for that wonderful, wonderful history and great photos. It's just very moving. And thank you for reminding us of her. I agree with you about her being so grounded in history and how that contextualized everything. The other thing is, besides a historian, she was a poet. And I think that also grounded her in lots of ways. And she was so many, many things. And the one thing I think you didn't mention in your history is, unless I have it wrong, I believe yesterday, March 30th, was... Um, your mom and dad's wedding anniversary. I think it's, the, yeah, I think it's April 1st, but you could be right. I it was I had a note in my calendar for the 30th, right <laughs> but they, it's around sorry. now. <laughs> they all, I remember them having a, having a big, big, they always had parties. I mean, they really did. Yeah. And they, I think it was definitely April 1st or 2nd that they had their huge party. And you may be right about the actual date, well, my calendar says the 30th, but it's around now. So we're celebrating them both. So thank we you are. for that, that history. And let me say to everyone, we, we purposefully and set this up for Ida to have the longer period of time for what she just did for us all. Um, our remaining speakers are, are all meant to be less than, but no more than 10 minutes. So I hope that all of you comply because we do want a few minutes at the end for a little bit of a casual um, you know, comments and, and, and greetings before we have to stop at 11 o'clock. So please, next, speak, next group of speakers, 10 minutes or less. I'm gonna pass it on now to, um, to Karisha Abdul Karim. Um, we, I'm not do, I'm going to do very brief bios because we know there's so much about all of these people who are going to speak. Um, but Karisha is an infectious disease epidemiologist and co-founder and associate scientific, scientific director of Caprisa. She is professor in clinical epidemiology, Columbia University in New York and vote pro vice chancellor for African health, University of KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, and a dear friend and colleague of Zena's. Um, the floor is yours, Karisha. Thank you very much, uh, Bob. And, and I'm really honored and privileged to have this opportunity. I think uh, all of us on the call um, uh, had very near and dear relationships with Zina. And, um, and, and so in, in having this opportunity to, to look at her multifaceted contributions to science and society through one very short lens. And part of uh, the other presentations is gonna be looking at her other contributions. And, and overall, I think given that it's HIV Center Grand Rounds, we all sort of focused on HIV. But uh, as you've heard from Ida's introduction, her contributions have been much broader and, and more vast than uh, HIV. And when we think about HIV, just you know, over 40 years since the first reported cases and to think about what um, Zina and uh, Anka did in setting up the HIV center, their contributions, et cetera. And for me, I always have very fond memories that span nearly three decades uh, of uh, grand rounds at the HIV center. And um, I don't think we all, any of us prepare for tributes and certainly not tributes to family, friends, colleagues, and somebody who's all of those things. And, um, I just recalled our last, uh, Slim and I met with Zina in September 23rd last year, and we drove out to Pennsylvania. Ruthie, with all her warmth and hospitality, um, hosted us. And uh, Zina, of course, right away needed to have updates on everything we were doing. So first the science, then it's the family, then it's about the friends, then it's about the politics and it can go on. And we had a wonderful day. And in fact, we were thinking about, oh, we're gonna celebrate a hundred birthday. Little did we know then that would be our last 
interaction. But I think we all know Zina as a very unique individual. She had a unique type of wisdom. She always knew what to do way before anybody else knew what needed to be done. She always did the right thing. And I think um, Ida reflected on that social justice component. And she would do that fearlessly. And, um, and I know sometimes if something really irked her, I'd call it, Zina has a bee in her bonnet and you want to keep a very wide berth when Zina had a, a bee in a bonnet and if it any way reflected or may overlap in what you're doing. But I think, um, you know, to be able to have in our lives someone of her caliber and, and, and a woman and a human being, a person, and I wanted to use the word mensch, but somehow my uh, Yiddish is really bad. So I kind of think mensch is, uh, is about like men and given her strong feminist kind of leanings, um, I don't know what the feminist equivalent is, but it's this epitome of a human being that um, that is so few and far between that we really blessed when they cross our lives. So uh, moving on, I, um, part of what I'm going to talk about is about prevention um, of uh, HIV infection in women and particularly young women. But I think that um, while I'm talking about this and to some extent, you will see some of my work there, some of the work from uh, our days at MRC and Caprisa, I think I'm also a voice for many thousands, if not hundreds of women across the globe that have benefited um, from uh, Zina's wisdom and uh, commitments and, and, and insights. And um, I'm going back to 1988 um, when I first met Zina. And uh, Zina uh, uh, was quite daunting until I met Anka. But I think between them, they kept me on the straight and narrow most of the time. And Zina was my uh, mentor and supervisor for my uh, master's at Columbia University. And the thing she always imprinted on me is that one, as women scientists, we have special roles and responsibilities. Two, that um, as women scientists, if we don't focus on women's health and women's issues, nobody else would. And uh, we really need to push the envelope on that. And then uh, thirdly, the importance of data. So anecdotes are great. And she was a great storyteller in social settings. And I think all of us will know her very well. In, in an academic setting, she was a woman of a person of very few words, but she had the knack of getting to the hub of the issue. And even if she nodded off in later years during a talk, she'd wake up and ask the most profound question. And I said, I wish when I grow old, I'm gonna have, uh, develop that skill set <laughs> and so on. But this is a long journey. And I put this here because it was the beginning of Slim and My Life together meeting Mervyn and Zena, I think we ultimately took a lot of cues from them on public health and what to do in serving humanity. So we know in 1990, this is the most pivotal paper that was written in terms of preventing HIV infection in women. How did Zena know to publish this in the American Journal of Public Health way back then, when the world's focus was largely on the MSM and IDU transmission in industrialized countries, she was able to discern that everything we had available for preventing infection did nothing for women. And if women were vulnerable and, and were at risk of getting infected, none of these things could be done without male cooperation. And she wrote this commentary in the American Journal of Public Health that I think stirred and catalyzed a whole movement of scientists, of donor investments, and, and all kinds of things that I'll cover more. But for me, it was also an important point. But I, uh, returning to South Africa in 1989 and joining the Medical Research Council, I was also reminiscing on the HIV epidemic as it was unfolding in uh, the US, in Europe and uh, North America generally, but also in New York City, where we had different types of experiences in Harlem and the Bronx. So we were on the east uh, side of um, Manhattan. 
And um, we were hearing about HIV in other parts of Africa and knew very little about what was going on in Southern Africa. And remembering Zena, I did one of the first population-based surveys together with SLIM. And lo and behold, um, in the analysis of the data, we had a prevalence of less than 1%. Zena's words during 88 rung in my head. And I did the sex disaggregated analysis, showed HIV infection uh, four times more in women compared to men. And uh, most, moreover, doing the age and gender analysis, there's five to seven year difference between when women get infected versus uh, men. And uh, the next thing, you know, as we went along, um, as you know, when you have Zena in your life, it's not for when you are physically in front of her, it's a lifelong relationship, both with Mervyn and Zena. And what started on our return, the unbanning of the, uh, of the African National Congre Congress, the move towards democracy being established in South Africa, was Mervyn and Zena started to come more often to South Africa. And part of these visits was visiting everybody that they knew uh, across the country and then talking about science and you know as we looked at the data so Zena's next question was like so why and so that started a whole lot of uh, zero epidemiological studies and I was looking at Phil earlier and 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 also Ida remembers that trip we applied for a grant to the International Center for Research on Women it was um, money that was allocated by USAID to understand better HIV infection in women and the next thing, Ida was there with Jonah, who was still about a year old or so, and Phil. And we'd be going through all kinds of communities and talking to women of all ages. And we were talking to rural women, peri-urban, urban sex workers, and uh, just getting that narrative and talking to men as well to try and understand why and what was going on at a community level. So when we talk about knowing your epidemic locally, understanding the drug drivers of that epidemic. UNAIDS has been writing about that more recently. Zena was living it uh, many decades ago. Correct. And, uh, as, as, requ as requested, I'm giving you your two minute warning. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so, um, you know, um, one of the things as we grasp this uh, risk women we're facing, uh, we started to do the early microbicide trials. And this is one of the first trials we did looking at repurposing existing drugs, so very akin to what we're doing with COVID-19 just now with a young uh, medical graduate, Roxana Rastamji. And we continue to do our quest for microbicides. And then in 1995, I was recruited to um, set up the National AIDS Program by the Mandela administration. And you can be sure we're thinking we're going to include female condoms in this uh, program and Zena figured all this out and sent Joanne Mantel to help. In the meantime, um, we continued to look for um, microbicides. It was a very long and slow process. But I think what was important was that Zena being the consummate networker and connector actually ended up over this period where we were faced with failure upon failure and challenges upon challenges was catalyzing a whole global movement. And I like to think about us out there all trying to find methods women can use to prevent HIV infection and um, the Xena's warriors. And, and we're there, we're out there, and we're strong and in, in great numbers. So it's expanded to a number of different organizations uh, getting involved in the quest for a microbicide. Uh, and, and I think one of the highlights was the NIH creating dedicated networks looking for microbicides or women initiated methodologies. And then the International AIDS Conference that changed the world. And this is, you know, the moment where we had the announcement of the, for the first time, a woman initiated technology. And they're celebrating. I remember opening my presentation, recognizing and paying tribute to Anka and Zina and the whole audience, just some of you on the call will remember it just, you know, I, I thought I'm not gonna get to my uh, presentation because of the excitement and joy just hearing that Zina was in the audience and that's a picture from then. But this is that long road that we've had and many, many um, uh, things that have moved on and Zina then going, where's the policy, where's the practice and getting that going. 
And then we can see how, you know, a next chapter starting as Zina uh, took a step back from very active research, a whole range of new players. And I think she would be delighted to see this picture, that this is what the future of prevention technologies, a dream come true. Some of it realized, some on the horizon, but no story ended yet. And I would be remiss in not saying that there are many, many challenges that remain in terms of preventing infection. And in Zina's honor, I think many of us remain committed to seeing this journey to its end. And then I just want to say, Hamagashle Zina, an iconic scientist, a fearless leader, a generous mentor, a dear friend, a critical colleague, an amazing human being, leaving all of us richer for being in it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Koresha. That was just such a wonderful history. I think we need to invite you to give an entire seminar on that history um, because there's a lot that could be expanded on. That was wonderful. Thank you. Okay, now um, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Wafa El Sadr, our a Columbia University professor here and the director of ICAP at Columbia, also Columbia World Projects and the Center for Infectious Disease Epidemiological Research at Columbia Melman School of Public Health. Over to you, Wafa, and um, like um, each of you, because I will be giving you a two, each, a two minute warning if you guys are running uh, beyond eight minutes. <laughs> Over to you, Wafa. Thank you, Bob, and, uh, and I will not be taking uh, 10 minutes. Um, I think um, what I wanted to do uh, in a few minutes is just to give a, uh, you know, just a very personal perspective on uh, Zina and her meaning um, and what she meant to me personally. And, um, you know, in thinking about this, um, this event today, I was reflecting that uh, for each and every one of us on this, uh, at this meeting, we probably can think of, um, uh, you know, some a pivotal moment in our life or a, in a person we met or a teacher we had or a patient we saw if we're clinicians or uh, there are these moments that are incredibly important that um, we're really in some ways we you know transformational and um, in, in our own career in our own life in, in, in some way or another and I think uh, you know without a doubt when I think about my own life and my own career uh, I think that meeting uh, Zina and Mervyn uh, was one of those uh, pivotal moments um, and um, in many ways it was uh, for many of the reasons that I think uh, Koresha talked about and Ida talked about, which is, um, you know, that um, Zina and Mervyn were so unique in so many ways um, that you couldn't but just gravitate towards them. And um, you wanted to be with them. You wanted to be there um, to learn from them, to hopefully get some of their commitment to <laughs> spill over to you. <laughs> To be energized by, uh, by, uh, by their, um, but what by what they were doing, what they were thinking, what where they were going. It was, it was, um, it, you know, it was. Um, they it was like they were like a magnet, you know, that many of us gravitated to because of uh, because of what we got back from them. Um, and um, you know, when I think about it, it's um, there are really few people that um, embraced. Uh, uh, people and embrace so many of us on this call in a very, very um, meaningful way. They, they embraced uh, people, they uh, took us under their wings, um, they opened their home to, uh, to people. Um, and, and that was so unique and different. And I think that's why it was so memorable in, in so many ways. Um, and also because through uh, Mervyn and through Zina, um, it was, um, uh, you also were able to connect with so many other people. It was almost like a, you know, a, a domino effect. You, you, you got to meet wonderful people. You got to be with wonderful people. And of course, when I think back on the many um, days and many evenings that we spent in the garden or in their house uh, or on travel together, I always remember the, the very stimulating conversations. And these were not stimulating, easy conversations. These were stimulating, difficult conversations. But they didn't run away from uh, those difficult conversations. They, they, they tackled them head on and, um, and were always interested in bringing different voices to the room, listening to different voices. And um, 
and obviously it was a privilege to be there uh, to uh, to be part of some of these conversations and to engage and and learn from uh, the richness uh, of peoples and ideas that they brought together. I think many of us use the word commitment uh, too easily, and um, and I can't um, I can imagine many of you use it many times during one day, uh, but really. Um, you know, one has to use that word very judiciously. And, and when I think about commitment, I really think of Zina. I mean, she embodied commitment, what it meant to be committed, um, that it, it becomes part of the fabric of who you are. It's not just what you talk about. It's not what you think about some of the time. It's who you are and what you are every moment of the day and night. And, and to me, that's what I saw in Zina. And to me, uh, that was the lesson I learned from Zina is, is, is to be committed means that it has to be part of who you are and what you do and how you think and, 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 and ever present, um, um, you know, uh, an ever present part of, of your, of the fabric of who you are. And lastly, I think what's also always um, was, was really remarkable is that, you know, Zina and obviously Mervyn, they cared about populations, they cared about public health, they cared about equity and justice. And, but at the same time, they cared so much about their family and they cared so much about their friends. And that's an unusual uh, also combination of people who are able to, um, to care about so many, to care about the groups and populations, but at the same time, at the same time to fundamentally nurture and love and care uh, about their family and about their friends. So uh, I want to end by saying it's, um, I could spend hours and hours talking about wonderful anecdotes of, uh, of, uh, of being with and traveling with Zina in particular, uh, but I know we don't have time, but I just wanted to share a few words on just um, what Zina really meant to me personally and how she changed my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wafa. That was just very powerful and well said. And, and I really appreciate your emphasis on, on Zina's commitment and, and, and really follow through and sticking to it. And she taught all of us and inspires us all in that way. Our next speaker is Anke Earhart, um, who is Emeritus Professor of Medical Psychology and Psychiatry at Columbia, and of course, the founding director of our HIV Center for Clinical Behavioral Studies, along with Zina Stain as our co-director and close partner and ally and good friend. The floor is yours, Anka. You're on mute, Anka. It's like you're still on mute. There you go. Now? Yeah, okay. now it's good. Okay, I mean, what is, what is so clear in listening is what an extraordinary woman Zina was and how much she has meant to all of us. Her, Zina's role and contribution in founding and sharing the agenda of the HIV Center for Clinical and Behavioral Studies in 1987 was essential and remained crucial for 25 years and beyond. And in that context, a few significant memories of mine will illustrate Zina's critical role for the establishment of the agenda and the history of the HIV Center. So in 1986, the HIV epidemic tragically and rapidly affected largely the gay male community. As a sex and gender research, researcher funded by NIMH, I was one of the few women researchers who repeatedly was asked by NIMH to be on review committees and site visits. NIMH, under the leadership of Ellen Stover, developed an AIDS Center grant, grants initiative and very much wanted one of the Center grants to be in New York. Her parties, who was then the chair of psychiatry at CUMC, approached me in December of 1986 about whether I would take this on as PI and director of the HIV Center application. And Herb and I approached Zina and Bob Spitzer about whether they would join me to develop 
the application, which was due April 15, 1987. This was three days before Christmas in 1986. I just was coming back from, from Germany, where I had been a visiting professor, and Herb had called me in Germany and had said that Ellen Stober had asked whether uh, we could develop a, a, a center grant of that kind, and she had mentioned my name. And I had a big research program, and I was clear that I didn't want to do that. So I, of course, Herb was, those of you who knew him, he was totally determined. And the first day I came back, I was in his office. And I said, you know, I really don't want to do this. I said, what about, you know, as if he just thought about that at that moment, what about Zina Stein and Bob Spitzer? And I said, well, I'm sure they have total, you know, I thought they wouldn't do it. So he said, let's get them, let's get them up. And he asked them, would you, uh, Anke, uh, uh, will, I have asked her to do the HIV center, would the two of you become co-directors? And Zina was totally, was laughing and said, yes, we do. And forever in all those, many years that we have been friends, I said to her, did you know this before? Did Herb call you before? Did you spontaneously say, yes, you would do it? She said, oh, I will never tell you. So, so it was, it was clear that, I mean, I, I always thought, I never, she never did. So uh, then we started to, started to work like mad and the, the, the application was due on April 15. This was December. This was before computers, remember? So they set up a computer thing in, in, the, in the basement of the old uh, PI and uh, we worked like mad. And we got every administrative support which we could. And then Zina, Bob and I produced a center grant, grant application consisting of multiple, multiple books as it was at that time. It was at, ultimately became the largest grant NIMH had ever funded by that time. And in the fall of 1987, seven, we had a several day site visit as it was at that time. AIDS in 87 was a controversial and stigmatized disease. And a number of colleagues at CUMC did not want to participate. The Department of Medicine at CUMC refused to get involved. Now medicine is critical, obviously. And Zina and I worked together constantly to find solutions regarding such critical obstacles and to discuss alternatives. So we got, we approached colleagues at Roosevelt and at St. Luke's Hospital who joined us. And of course, ultimately Rafael Sada when she became the leading clinician and researcher of the AIDS program at Harlem Hospital. Zina and I were in constant contact, literally every day, as you can imagine with that uh, kind of responsibility. And Bob Spitzer was also helpful and particularly he recruited Bob Ramian, uh, but, and obviously Bob who was the current uh, center director was very important. Uh, and Bob Spitzer ultimately decided to leave the center leadership after a few years. He had his own agenda. He didn't want to do it. I remember he was in my office in tears to, to leave us, but he said he just couldn't do it. So Zina was a rock of support available always with ideas for solutions. And she, she and I became very close friends. We were in daily contact and there were many crises and challenges during our first years and also later years. Here are some, a couple of examples. During one of the first yearly AIDS Memorial Days, it prompted us to have posters and condom distribution in one of the entrances of one of the CUMC buildings, hospital buildings. One of the colleagues complained about us uh, and said that this was in bad taste and insisted on the removal of our material. So that was an example. I would be on the phone to Zina immediately. What are we going to do? 
And she would say without, without hesitation, let's go. And I said, where are we going? And she said, of course, we are going to the Dean to complain. And so we did. And we reversed, we reversed the obstacle and the AIDS material remained where we had put it. Zina's moral compass was unerring, as you have heard from several of these uh, from these presentations today, and as you all know, if you knew her. And the HIV center were, were very much because of her moral pounds, uh, compass strong effort. She was eager to introduce me to South Africa and to set up collaborations with the Karems. And Karasia and Slim became valuable colleagues and friends to us and to the HIV center. We faced many challenges and critics during the 25 years of our HIV center. We had in our friendship was really often daily contact. As you remember, those of you who have been with all of us, we had very sad uh, events, of course. People were dying, colleagues were dying. Rafael Tavares was a leader in, in HIV and AIDS. He died in the very early time. And uh, it was just, just awful. And then his mother, Rafael's mother, we wanted to have a memorial in the, in the, uh, across the street for, for him. And his mother uh, and his brothers, who were totally homophobic, who didn't come. And she, she said, to me, you know, but you can't mention that he was a gay man. I said, well, then you can't come. So I talked to her, she came without her sons. And we had that very, that very moving event at the, at the faculty club. Charlie Armstrong, my close, my close assistant, only to mention there were several others who we all went through with, uh, seeing that they are, you know, getting the best care. Charlie at one point uh, was ill. He was actually with us for several years. And Richard Mayhew in neurology took, took that on, had him as an inpatient, called Zina and me because he didn't want to stay. He had to, he had said he needed to get back and he needed to, he had a responsibility, et cetera. And, uh, we got over there and, and Richard was saying, you have to do something, et cetera. And she said, Charlie turned to me and said, you are not my mother. And Zina without a beat would say, if she is not your mother, I'm your grandmother and you're going to stay here. And he stayed and, was, and that gave him another several years actually, actually after that. Uh, Anka, this is such an important history. I hate to even interrupt. I'm just, I am going to give you your two minute warning. Okay. As, as requested. I will do this that. Yes. Great history. Thank you. She was always, Zina was always a completely reliable partner. And as you know, Zina had academic positions in both psychiatry and the School of Public Health. But her loyalty and her commitment to the HIV Center in psychiatry and to me personally was never in question. Here's one example. After several years and renewals of the HIV Center, there was a suggestion by the leadership of the School of Public Health to move the leadership of the HIV Center from psychiatry over to the School of Public Health. I discussed it with Zina and she was firm to have it stay in psychiatry, but to remain in partnership with the School of Public Health. We had a meeting with Ellen Rosenfield and Cheryl Hilton and agreed on the status quo. Thus the leadership remained in psychiatry, but we are in close collaboration with the School of Public Health. So Zina and I became close friends and were in frequent contact for many years. I will miss her dearly and I will never forget her. Her legacy will last forever. Thank you so much, Anka. Such an important, important history. And incredible what you two created and founded in this HIV center. Um, 
Well, not by ourselves. Not by <laughs> yourselves. A lot, <laughs> big team of people, big team of folks. Yes. You know? and, um, no, it's great. And and you know, you both brought that all that all those people together. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, our next speaker is um, another long-term HIV Center colleague, um, Alice Caballo Diegas, who's happily retired at the moment. Um, he's a former research scientist here at New York State Psychiatric Institute and Columbia University, professor of clinical psychology, former co-director of our HIV Center, and along with all of our speakers today, a close and dear colleague and friend of Zena's. Thank you, Bob. It's nice to see all your faces, and thank you guys for inviting me to participate. Let me share with you some um, slides. Uh, there we go. So I joined the HIV Center in 1988, and Anka hired me. Soon I met Zina, uh, and I was really uh, uh, marveled by Zina's um, sharp mind, her assertiveness, and at the same time, the kindness she had in everything she did. She was us usually trailed by her mentees that were often foreign, from foreign, foreign countries and were looking at her with adoring eyes. As um, it was mentioned before, she uh, and Mervyn used to host these wonderful parties in their house on Hastings on Hudson. And it was a very relaxed atmosphere, great flowers, great trees, wonderful barbecue, and um, also a, a way to distend and to coalesce as a group at a time when we were just getting to know each other. Um, Carisha mentioned this article, which was a, a landmark at the time when Zina and uh, Zina and Anka were working on, on uh, uh, issues that um, were uh, necessary for women. And, um, and Zina published this article on the needs for methods that women can use. And if you look at the bottom of the, um, of the uh, abstract, she was talking about a topical virus side. Of course, a gel that could be used to prevent HIV transmission by a topical application in the vagina at that point. Um, this later become became rephrased as a virus, as a microbicide. I thought the idea was fantastic. And I thought uh, that it could also be used by gay men who use lubricants for anal sex. However, initially there were some concerns that that could detract from the women's agenda. So when I mentioned that to Zina, she smiled it off and said, rubbish, a very British word, right? And she said, what you need to do is to talk with someone who, who prescribes medication like gels for um, rectal or, or anal pathologies. And so let's have a meeting with um, my proctologist. So she uh, organized this meeting, took me and took uh, Helda Zayes, who was a mentee of hers at that time, I quickly explained what the idea was. Zina said that the Population Council was developing um, a, a product uh, with Karagina that was advanced in terms of safety, and that we, what we needed to do was a phase one safety study with a few people. And she said, we have three volunteers, Mervyn, Alex, and myself. <laughs> and that was the kind of support she was, she was giving. Fantastic. Uh, we, I, we didn't go on with the phase one because it wasn't the right time, but uh, I was encouraged by her support to start um, e exploring the issue about use of uh, rectal lubricants by men. And we worked together um, on a project that years later uh, culminated in a publication in the American Journal of Public Health and also a presentation at the 13th um, annual AIDS meeting that took place in Durban. This picture was taken in Durban. As you see, Zina has some uh, marks on her face of tribal painting. She was so happy at that meeting. She had met old friends like Nelson Mandela, nonetheless, and who spoke at the conference and uh, many other people who had been her colleagues for years. And she was particularly focused on helping us uh, younger investigators to um, network and to associate with other people because it was a very rich environment. 
I have to thank Sandra Elkin for this picture that I kept in my um, bookcase in my office for the next 22 years. Zina was very assertive in the things that she said, but you know her voice was not too strong, but her logic was completely forceful. So just to give you an anecdote, because we don't have too much time, when the um, Pop Council was, was uh, conducting the studies on microbicides, they were proposing of course, to test the product against the, the placebo. And the placebo was always changing according to the type of product that they were using. And Zina said, well, that's, that's not good science because what we need is not to waste time taste testing that the placebo is safe. So we need a universal placebo. Now, this idea was very disruptive at the time and not, not too many people uh, wanted it. So. Um, she piled up her mentees in a taxi. We went to the population council at the day that a very important meeting was being held to talk about future trials. And she talked and talked and talked and, 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 and um, challenged everyone who said the, the idea was not good. Well, as a result, years later, most or many of, of the studies on microbicides used, used a universal placebo as she proposed. Um, I went through some of the messages that I had in, in, my, in my email from her, and I thought they were just so funny. For example, in this one, she says, oops, uh, she says, um, since you and I are usually at the same point in our thinking, how about men? Now, I don't remember what that was about, but it was very funny. In this other one, she's, um, she knew that I was working on, on uh, microbicides, and so she said, I thought that of you when the FDA released uh, information on home testing. Also, when I had my mouth full of ice cream uh, yesterday when I celebrated my birthday, Zina at 90. Um, other times she would invite me to, to social events or to artistic events. This one was one in which an, a South African artist was presenting his work. And she said, Cam will be among the friends who will attend. And, uh, Cam was Kamago, who is currently listening to this presentation. So, you know, how, how and then sometimes she would send poems, uh, snip, snippets of poems. And this one, I won't read it, but she, she uses this phrase, apo apocryphally attributed to Martin Luther. Now, I hope that in our 90s, we will be able to write a phrase with such elegance. So, you had to love her. There was no other way. Um, in 2013, there was um, a letter that was circulated by the um, Columbia University asking people if they wanted to propose uh, uh, professors for nomination as emeritus professors. And I um, asked uh, um, Ezra's help, as well as um, help from Mobolaji Ibitoye, who was a Nigerian woman working in our team. And together we put a, a letter that we sent to the committee for evaluation. Um, the, the, the committee, of course, you know, uh, selected her for the honor of being emeritus professor. And they held a, 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 a lunch party in in the downtown campus there were round tables and each each candidate for the position was sitting with some of their friends it was 10 or 12 people and zina looked at me across from the table and said do you always come to these events and i said no only when i nominate someone for emeritus professor <laughs> and she had a sparkle in her eyes and then she laughed and and we, we got a kick out of that um, when I um, had my jubilation party or my retirement party, uh, Zina had, was invited, of course, and she wrote that um, she was going to send me a video. But a few days before the meeting, she wrote back and said, better, better than that, I, I am coming. And I was thrilled that she would take the, the effort to join, um, given that given her age and given the, the complications of coming to, to, 
to uh, the offices, but she was there. She brought a, a, a book as a present, Love Poems for the Journey to Light. And she wrote a lovely dedicatory, which also quoted another um, Persian poet. Oh, because Hafiz, the, uh, whose uh, poems are in, in this um, uh, book, uh, is a Persian uh, poet from the 14th century. And as, as uh, Bob Remian said, poetry was always in her mind. And, and I think that um, it, it brought a different aspect of her personality to us. Zina loved the, that meeting, I think. Two minute warning, Alex. Yes. <laughs> Keep I'm going. About that. I'm about that. Um, this is Kamago, who um, was present at the meeting. And Zina also met many other people who had, uh, or, or um, uh, saw again people uh, she had worked with for many years. And unfortunately, she couldn't stay till the end of the meeting. But at one point, she, um, before she had to leave, she stood up, requested a microphone, and um, led the audience into a song. Thank you, Zina, for your inspiration and your friendship. And thank you all for listening to me. Sorry, you were on mute. Thank you, Alex, for that really wonderful, wonderful presentation. Very creative, as always, and very, very heartfelt. It moved me to tears. Um, OK, our, our final speaker, and then um, I have Claude up for a few minutes at the end, but right now I want to pass it over to Louise Kuhn, Professor of Epidemiology in the Sojewski Center in the Department of Epidemiology. Um, she manages an international research program in HIV AIDS among women and children with a longstanding focus on the HIV epidemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. Another dear colleague and dear friend of Zena. The floor is yours, Louise. With the weight of sadness in my heart, um, I look back and I remember joy and laughter. I remember how much fun it was to spend time with Zeno. I remember the trip we took together to Rome in 2011. It was the IAS meeting. The work on providing antiretrovirals longer term for prevention of mother to child transmission had surged forward with implementation and breastfeeding could now be unequivocally supported for children born to women living with HIV in every setting. Promising results on topical antiretrovirals for prevention of sexual transmission of HIV to women was shaking up the adult HIV prevention agenda. And the voices of women were being heard to shape the success of HIV care and treatment programs that had started and would thrive in the next decade. The conference center was in the Villa Borghese Gardens and the ancient Malfi pines soared above our heads. I remember Zena's phone call to me a few weeks before the conference. You have to tell them that you'll look after me in Rome. I won't be a bother, but they won't let me go on my own. Not being a parent myself or even a doctor or nurse, I wasn't sure that I had any credentials in the looking after anybody department that would pass much muster with them. I felt like Zena and I were teenagers trying to pull a fast one on our parents for an overnight party with no adult supervision. But Zena's charm prevailed and they let us loose to run wild and free in Rome on our own and we had loads of fun. Not so much the security guard at the Holocaust Museum in Rome, who tried to explain to Zena that no, at 7.30 in the morning on her way to the airport with the taxi waiting, she could not just pop in for a quick look when they only open at 11. 
We'd looked at the hours the night before and had seen that it would not fit with the time of her flight. Unfazed, Zena said to me, I thought I'd try anyway, and suggested a quick walk through the ghetto, which we did. In January 2018, I sent Zena this photo that I took at the top of Bain's Cliff in the mountains outside Cape Town. My partner rented and rode a bicycle at Bain's Cliff Pass, which you can see from the sign was originally built in 1853 and reconstructed in 1934. You can also see in this photo the charred remains of a landscape after devastating fires. The rich Feinbos biodiversity of this region, which includes the well-recognizable proteas, do need some fire in their regeneration. But a heating and a drying planet makes the fires, both lightning and human-induced, increasingly only destructive. Zina emailed me in response, Mervyn, stationed in Oatshorn and in Port Elizabeth in World War II, flew over all those landmarks too. I scaled the Klein Winterhoek near Tulbach, very beautiful, and of course skied, well almost, in Weihook, where the University Mountain Club was situated in the Hottentots Hollands. Names all changed now, I'm sure. Zina and I shared a love of those mountains, and she knew when she wrote me that I would appreciate just how much of a mountain jock she had been when she was younger. I too have scaled the peak where the University of Cape Town Mountain Club is still situated. And I know about that thin crusting of icy snow that sometimes provides a so-called ski run between the talus on the slopes of Vihook. That run is only for those who embrace what this big wide world has to throw at us and is only for the fearless. And there's certainly no doubt that Zena was fearless. From that same trip, I sent Zena this photo too of Table Mountain in Cape Town. The cloud forming the tablecloth shrouding Table Mountain indicates a black southeaster, which is a powerful gale force wind that blows in the summer. It was a particularly strong southeaster that fanned the flames of the fires in Cape Town in April 2021, which burned much of the African Studies Library and Botany Collections at the University of Cape Town. The flames le leapt over the Malfi Pines and the slopes of Devil's Peak, incinerating some of them, but not all of these mighty trees. We see in this picture too, a person coming down from the mountain with tinder, most likely to sell for shack construction to homeless people living in the inner city. Most of us met Zena when she was facing down the HIV pandemic as it ex exploded in post-apartheid South Africa, wreaking havoc with reconstruction. In March 2020, Zena was facing down COVID, unafraid, sending me emails showing her curiosity and alertness to this, this new pandemic that like HIV would exacerbate the complex social problems that exist in our world. But we never thought to have a drought, Zena wrote me in response to this picture. This used to be Tiervatoskloof Dam and the major source of water for Cape, the Cape Town region. But in January 2018, it was almost empty and the region was on the brink of running out of water. Miraculously, the rains came and the immediate crisis passed, but the long-term problems remain. The interconnected environmental and social crises that we all now face loom very large. As the darkness descends, I think of Zena. She stared evil in the face and she was not afraid, fearless, an exemplary life, an inspiration. Thank you, Zena. Thank you so much, Louise. And again, just all of you, I wish we just, I wish each one of you could talk a whole lot longer and we need to do more of this. And actually we're gonna tell you about an event that's happening, that's coming up that will be uh, more time to honor uh, Zena. Um, I'm gonna turn the floor over uh, briefly to, to Claude Mellons um, to talk about um, some future events. Over to you, Claude. Um, 
Hi, everybody. So I'm, um, I'm just a little bit overwhelmed also by everybody's words. And um, if I can, and there's time, I'm going to throw in one minute of my own. But I am thrilled to have been asked by Teo to chair um, the committee that's going to keep this rounds um, an annual event with speakers to keep Zena's memory and work alive. Um, to keep, you know, in the center that she co-created and co-nurtured. And I think uh, Phil Kroniski, her grandson, and Louise Kuhn are on that committee with me. Um, and we will obviously be supported by her children in, in the speakers that we bring in. Um, so if you have ideas of future speakers, let us know. And then also really importantly, as you could see today, we could spend hours here discussing Zena and Louise Kuhn with the Department of Epidemiology and the Alan Berkman Memorial Lecture um, uh, have an event um, Friday afternoon. Um, I think we have an announcement about it that might come up. Um, it's also in the chat. Just oh, it's in the chat. Time. Okay, so, um, and please, please come. That, that will be in person um, in honor of Zena with some incredible speakers there. And then just on a personal note, if I could add this, I think that we've heard about her brilliance her extraordinary mentorship of so many of us um, and her vision uh, and her persistence and might I say stubbornness that made so many things happen. I, I wanna say something entirely different. <laughs> um, one, um, she never forgot that each of us is something besides a faculty member, a staff member. Um, we, we have other roles. Um, in my case, those roles were parenting. And even when she was ripping my papers to shreds, she was supporting me in my parenting of my children. Um, and she let me know, um, and this is really to Ida, Ezra, and Ruthie, that she was a mom first and that she never stopped being a mom. And then actually she was a grandparent first, so Phil and others who are on this, um, and that she would stay up all night worrying um, about them. Um, and so it made me feel less anxious about my own anxiety going forward. And the second thing I want to say that I think everybody else actually has highlighted in some ways is that she taught us all how to age with grace and power. Um, I don't know how many of you have given rounds in the past 10 years. I know, Phil, you did, um, that she was present at or have worked on a paper with her. I think it sounds like, Louise, you were. Um, but she brought her razor intellect to the end, um, even when words were failing her. And the third thing that people have alluded to is her love of poetry. Um, she read a poem at my wedding. And by the way, to those of you from South Africa, this was her wedding present to me. Um, and, and that was 30 years ago. And the last words I heard from Zena were actually a poem she recited with my mom on a Zoom call that Ruthie helped me set up. Maybe it was Woodsworth, I'm not really sure, Ruth. <laughs> That's what my mother thinks. Um, she couldn't string a full sentence together, but she could perfectly recite poetry. And that's how I hope we will remember her, the scientist, the mother and grandmother, the poet, and the human, how lucky we all were to have her. Wow, thank you, Claude. Um, I, I know I'm terribly moved, as you can hear in my voice. And um, I think this was just amazing because it's an amazing woman that we're honoring and paying tribute to, and that we all miss very dearly. Um, so. I just appreciate all of this family coming together, family in every sense of the word. And as, as Susie put in the chat, as we're hearing the many, many dimensions of Zena, and I think there's a whole lot more we can say. Um, I'm just going to, um, to, I'm just saying thank you all. And we're at 11 o'clock, but you know, I think we can sit here for a minute if people just want to even casually shout out some things or say a few words. I know people will probably have to drop off and run to other things. But um, thank you so much for being here and we will continue to honor our beloved Zena Stain um, for years to come. Thank you all. Hello. I'm a family member from Boston and was tapped by Zena and Mervyn to become the chair of CHISA in Boston. And like everybody else, she saw what needed to be done and made me see it clearly. And I so enjoyed the opportunity to make a difference in a terrible situation, which we were never sure we could change. But being engaged felt so much better than just being in despair. And she knew that so well. I loved her and I wish she was the mother I could have and father I could have had, along with the ones I did have. <laughs> 
Thank you for sharing. Hi, this is Sarah Santana. Um, I live in Arizona. I know a few of you, but not all of you. And Zena was my mentor and professor in from 79 till now. Um, but there's one thing that um, is so important to me. When Nadine Gordimer won the Nobel Prize, in her interview in the New York Times, she said, she was asked why she didn't leave South Africa. And she said, because leaving the place where you were born is to lose your place in the world. And I am so grateful to Mervyn and Zena because they proved her wrong. <laughs> they accumulated around them people from the whole entire world connected them with each other, and they really gave us all a place in the world, even though most of us are no longer where we were born. And for that, I will be eternally grateful. Thank you. Very moving words. Very wonderful. So well said. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, chime in on one of life's serendipitous moments. Um, for those of us from the HIV Center, we know that Steve Rolnick doesn't usually attend our rounds. And I had known Steve for many, many years through motivational interviewing, although I had not met him personally until about 10 years ago. And so I knew that he had some work, you know, related to HIV and motivational interviewing in South Africa. So I saw him, I introduced myself, you know, so you could put a face to the name. And I said, you know, I'd really love to speak with you a bit more about your HIV work in South Africa because, you know, the center where I work at Columbia is, was founded, you know, uh, co-founded by uh, a really, you know, prestigious epidemiologist from South Africa. Uh, so it'd be great to figure out how to work together. And, this, and what's her name? And I said, Zina Stein. He goes, like, Zina Susser? I was like, yes. He goes, well, that's my cousin. <laughs> And wow. what, what a wonderful thing. So I came back from, from that conference and ran to Zeno's office and I said, guess who I just met your cousin. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, for those of us that are from big families, we don't keep tabs on, on everything that all of the extended cousins do. Uh, but she was delighted about this. Um, and for the next few years, whenever I would see her sit, I spoke to Steven and, and she would catch me up, Steve, on whatever you were doing. Um, and finally, I got, to, I told her, I said, you know, I'm heading to Berlin. There's a motivational interviewing conference. I will see Stephen. Um, and she says, oh, I need you to do me a favor. I want to send his, his young boy a toy. Uh, and boys like trucks. So can you buy him a truck and take it to him uh, to give to his son? which of course I did. And, and I was just like, what an honor to do that, right? And I remember Steve, you know, sitting with you in, in a little sofa on the way to the conference rooms, telling you that I had this upstairs for, to give you and how moved you were and how equally moved I was. And to me, that was, you know, knowing Zena as this amazing, you know, wealth of knowledge and force of nature. And to also see her appreciate this key little thing, right? I want <laughs> to send him a toy. Um, it was just profoundly beautiful. And for me, it was one of the most memorable experiences that I will have and thoughts, memories that I will have of her. Such a great antidote. Perhaps I, I can go ahead. Perhaps I can introduce myself. I'm I'm the, the guy. <laughs> Ivan has been talking about, and uh, Zena is my darling auntie, and uh, she hated me using that that word. And I only really knew her in her nineties, although the connections go way back through layers and layers of of family connections. And uh, I first heard she was involved in you know the world of HIV when I was in Cape Town on a visit. And I spoke to this, this professor from Stellenbosch University and I said, yeah, no, no, that's my aunt. And he said, what, that 
that that woman that walks bare feet to craft's pool and then swims naked in the Atlantic Ocean. And I said, well, yeah, it's it's possible. And, you know, I, I, I saw Zena briefly then. And then out of the blue, she came with Ruth to Cardiff, Wales, where I live. And uh, guess what her main preoccupation was? This is like aged about 95 with my daughter, 15-year-old daughter in the room. Uh, talk about a bee in a bonnet. I need a printer. Why, Auntie Zena, do you need a printer? So I can complete a paper on the train on the way back to London. And afterwards, my daughter said to me, Dad, I just hope you're like that at 95. So there's something serious for me to aspire to. And uh, the last time I saw Zena, I uh, visited New York and um, the generosity of, of the whole family, uh, I simply, it's still with me. And uh, I trudged up the hill in Hastings on wherever it is, <laughs> completely, <laughs> Hudson, completely jet lagged with this address of the house and the promise of a room in the dark after midnight, confused. And eventually I found the house and the bed. The bed was darling Auntie Zena's bed. She wasn't there. So I consider it a huge honor to say I've been in her bed. <laughs> and I, 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 I can really only thank you all from the bottom of my heart for this wonderful exchange here this afternoon. And I look forward with loving tenderness to meeting you all in the family again. And I hold very dear my memories of my crazy, wonderful auntie Zena. I'm truly very proud. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for introducing yourself and sharing that. It's very moving and made us smile as well, which is what Zena always does, is makes us smile. Ah, well, I don't know about you all, but I'm pretty <laughs> moved by so much of this. So let's, let's just keep, let's be in touch with each other. Let's keep her spirit, her, her, her memories, her wisdom, her everything that everyone said about her um, alive. And um, we will do that. And there are more events to celebrate Zena, and let's just keep in touch with each other because it's this human connection that Zena taught us is so important. Be well, everyone. Thanks.